Hey, good morning. Welcome to our online Good Friday service. It's a little bit unorthodox this year, but uh, we're meeting online again. So today is the one day in a year in the calendar where Christians generally tend to put aside to specifically remember and to commemorate the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'd like to begin this morning by reading a passage from the Bible, from the book of John, chapter 19, verses 1 all the way through to 31. It's a longish reading, but it's an important one. It gives the narrative of the death of the Lord Jesus. So let's read. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him, and the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put it on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again, and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that he may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple road, and Pilate said unto him, Behold, the man. When the chief priests therefore and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto him, Take ye him, and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid, and went again into the judgment hall, and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee, and have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that hath delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. And from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king, speaketh against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was the preparation of the Passover. And about the sixth hour, he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king. But Caesar. Then delivered he him therefore to be crucified, and they took Jesus away and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of the skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, on either side one, and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city, and it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Then said the chief priests of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the King of the Jews, but that he said, I am King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, to every soldier a part, also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said therefore among themselves, Let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said, They parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things therefore the soldiers did. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he said unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then said he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her into his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar, and put it upon hyssop, and put it 
into his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The Jews therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was a high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. And we'll end the reading there. And may the Lord bless the reading of his word to us this morning. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you that uh, you sent your son into the world to die for us, to lay his life down upon the cross for the sin of the world. Lord, we thank you for the declaration, the dying breath of the Lord Jesus Christ, where he said, it is finished. And Lord, we thank you that the Lord knew on the cross that what he needed to accomplish was accomplished. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for the finished work of Christ this morning. We pray for anyone that might be listening. We pray that uh, for any believer that's listening, that they would be encouraged through your word and through this message. And Lord, we pray for any person who does not yet know you, who has not yet placed their trust, come to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, that they would be challenged through this message to do so, that they would be challenged by the crucified body of the Lord Jesus Christ hanging on the cross of Calvary for them that they might come to believe, that they might come to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for their eternal salvation. In Jesus' name, Amen. So the passage that we just read um, gives the account of the execution of Jesus Christ by means of crucifixion. It is this historical event that Christians, as well as many non-Christians, in fact, uh, celebrate all over the world today. You know, today is called Good Friday. But why on earth would that name be given to this day? Why on earth would anyone decide to call today Good Friday? Why is it that a day in which we remember the execution of an individual is considered good? Now, in British history, uh, many people have been executed, uh, normally criminals, for crimes. Now, we annually celebrate uh, one of those days in this country on November the 5th. Uh, fireworks night or Guy Fawkes night if you like um, but we don't necessarily call it good bonfire night we don't necessarily say um, that it was good even though the gunpowder gun powder plot was discovered and that was a good thing um, we celebrate the, the uh, failure of criminals uh, rather than the death of an innocent man you see unlike Guy Fawkes Jesus Christ was not guilty of any crimes Yes, he was arrested. Yes, he was tried and he was executed as a criminal. But Pontius Pilate repeatedly said that Jesus was not guilty of the crimes that he had allegedly committed. So, unlike on Bonfire Night, Good Friday is not a celebration of the downfall and the riddance of a dangerous criminal, but rather it is a day that we remember the injustice uh, of an execution of an innocent man. So if it's the execution of an innocent man, why could we possibly call this day good? What could be good about it? In his children's book, uh, an author called Kevin DeYoung uh, refers to this day as the worst day ever, but he also refers to it as the best day ever. You see, in the passage that we read, we saw that Jesus Christ the eternal son of God was stripped, he was beaten, he was mocked, he had a crown of thorns placed on his head. He was then forced to carry his cross to Golgotha, the place of the skull, where he was nailed to it and he was put to torment and to open shame. On the cross he was mocked whilst he was up there and at the end he then declared it is finished before he gave up his spirit and died. It seemed that this man who had done so much good and who had promised so much had failed to deliver and had come to a very brutal and gruesome end. So in one sense, nothing about this can be described as good. See, God himself took on human flesh. He became a human. Uh, he was the God-man, if you like, and we, the human race, put him on the cross. See, Jesus Christ is the only person to ever live a completely righteous life to have ever lived a life with no sin, never once breaking the law of God, he was a perfect man, completely innocent and pure, and yet he was put to death on the cross. 
And this is what the young meant by saying it's the worst day ever, that we would put God on the cross. The Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. Jesus Christ had no sin, so not only did he not deserve death, but there is a sense in which Christ was incapable of death because he had no sin. So if he had no sin, how could he even die if he was truly sinless? 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21 says, For he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 1 John 2.2 2 says, And he is the propitiation of our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Romans 5.8 says, But God commended his love toward us in that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Hebrews 2.9 says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honour, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. And 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3 says, For I declared unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. See, these verses that I've selected, as well as many others, teach that Jesus, in becoming man, he was made a little lower than the angels, in order that he could suffer and taste death for everyone. Uh, these verses teach that it is of first importance that Jesus died for our sins. They teach that Christ died for us as a demonstration of the love of God for us, even while we were still sinners, still rebels and enemies of God. They teach that Christ is the propitiation of our sins, which means the satisfaction. He satisfies or appeases the wrath. He takes the punishment. He pays the price for that, that we were rightfully due to receive. And not just for Christians, but it says that his sin, uh, his death was enough to pay for the sin of the whole world. Not only did Jesus die for um, our sin and die to appease the wrath that was due to our sin, but we're told that Jesus Christ on the, on the cross became sin. Uh, in other words, there he was as the substitute. He became sin on the cross and died so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We as humans are slaves to our sin. We are born sinful. We are born as rebels against God. We are born as enemies of God with no way of earning righteous standing before a holy and just God. And anyone who's a parent can see this, that you don't have to teach your children to disobey you. You don't have to teach your children to say no. You don't have to teach your children to be selfish and to fight each other. Um, we're born that way. We have to learn right from wrong because we already know wrong. We're born wrong, if you like. Each of us is born broken. Each of us is born sinful. Um, and each of us needs to be rescued from that and needs to be fixed, as it were. Um, each of us has sinned. Um, and each of us knows that this is true. Each of us knows that we've sinned. And each of us knows that God exists. And we all know we've sinned because each of us has a conscience, that little sense of right and wrong in our heart that convicts us that we do not always do what is right. We might say it's a guilty feeling um, or something like that, but that's a conscience. To sin means to miss the mark. So we've fallen way short of the standards that God set. He set perfection as a standard, and each one of us has fallen way short of his glory and way short of his goodness. And that is why he had to come and die. And this is what we mean by it's also the best day ever. See, the wages of sin is death, and we each deserve death and hell. Christ went to the cross, however, to offer us forgiveness, freedom and his righteousness in place of our sin. You know, good Friday is called good not because of the suffering and the agony that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, experienced, but because of the victory that he accomplished in doing so. You know, through his death on the cross, he paid the sin penalty for the whole world. And with his dying breath, he declared the words, it is finished, to show that no more now needed to be done. There's nothing more that needs to be done. The blood of Jesus Christ has satisfied the righteous wrath of God against sin. However, this does not mean that everyone automatically will now just get free entrance into heaven willy-nilly. See, the Bible 
calls salvation the free gift, a free gift of God. The offer of eternal life has been made to every individual who is at, uh, who lives, every individual. Uh, but the free gift needs to be accepted. John 3.16 is perhaps the most famous verse in the Bible, and it says the following. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 5.24 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that hears my word and believes on him that sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death to life. John 6.47 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believes on me has everlasting life. And John 11.25 says, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Over and over and over again, the Bible says that the one condition for a person to be saved is to believe, to have faith. To use another word that means the same thing, uh, we can say that to have eternal life comes by faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. Each of the verses I just quoted from John's Gospel says that the belief must be in Jesus in the real Jesus, in the Jesus who is God eternal, who took on human flesh, being fully God and fully man, who was virgin born, lived a perfect sinless life, was crucified for the sin of the world, paying the debt that we could not pay, and rose again three days later as a testimony that his sacrifice had been accepted. Now, in order to be saved from your sin, in order to receive the free gift of eternal life, you must put your belief or your faith in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and his finished work. It really is that simple. Now, the Philippian jailer asked the Apostle Paul, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have never believed before, if you've never placed your faith in Christ, if you've never trusted him for your eternal salvation, May I challenge you this morning to really think about who he is and what he has done, to think about why it was necessary for him to go to the cross. Why would God need to go to the cross uh, if there was any other way that we could be saved? Why would God need to go to the cross um, unless he was paying the penalty of all the sins that you and I and the whole world have ever done? You know, without him, we remain lost. We remain in our sin. We remain headed for wrath and for condemnation. But in him, by believing in him, we receive forgiveness of sins, we receive his righteousness, we receive acceptance by God, and we receive the free gift of eternal life. You know, I trust and I hope that you've uh, been challenged a little bit this morning to think about those things. And if you do have questions, please don't hesitate to get in touch with us um, at the church. You can contact us on our website or on Facebook or by email. And I'm sure we'd love to hear from you if you've got any questions. Um, may God bless you today on Good Friday. Amen.